Ryan Barman to tell us about what Asian supermarkets want. It's a, it's a very big question and there's no simple answer and you really can't generalise because there are bigger differences within a market than there are between markets, to be honest. However, in the spirit of, of today's uh, um, conversation, I'd just like to draw out some, I think, common elements that I think might provide some uh, signposts for the Australian industry. While we talk, the things I'd like to try and answer today are, you know, why are we focusing on Asia? Why supermarkets? Uh, then go on to what they want and then potentially have a look at a case study. So why Asia? Well, the very short answer is our, our uh, conventional markets that have been there for many years, up to 100 years, have become much more problematic over the last 10 or 20. Europe, North America, and some mature markets in Asia have become much more difficult. Still big populations, you know, in those conventional markets of North America, Europe, still six, 700 million people, but aging populations, economic growth slowing, if not static, um, and retailer power in some of those markets is equivalent to, if not stronger, than it is here. And not to denigrate uh, retailers, we're talking about that today, but uh, there's some really interesting models working in those markets, but fundamentally, it's quite difficult for the grower to have the grower packer exporter uh, to uh, engage at a direct level. So why Asia? That's the reason why some of our conventional markets are more difficult, our older markets. And, and remember that Australia was shipping apples into the UK over 100 years ago by sea in wooden cases. So we talk about logistics today and the difficulties of logistics, and yet at a level we were able to actually export successfully uh, many years ago. And however, in those days, um, market access was a much less problematic issue. So why Asia? And I'm sure you've heard many, many presentations about the opportunities in Asia. And, and it can be very frustrating, I know, because you can actually almost taste the opportunity, but are we actually taking that opportunity? In, in many cases, <laughs> we're not. But the background is uh, increasing economies, you know, GDP growth of 5 10%, up to 10%. Population is still growing. Um, ANZ Bank have identified that in 2009 there were half a billion consumers in Asia. In 2030, there's expected to be 6 billion middle class consumers that have got disposable income. A completely different story uh, to what, what's been happening in the past. Urbanisation is becoming a, a major driver, so I'll probably use a number of China examples because I'm the manager for China, but I've lived in Asia for some time and had experience in many of the markets. And using China as an example with the, the, the impact they've had on the international market in terms of exports, that's driven a whole change in their, in their overall e economic demographic. So as you know, people are shifting to the major cities to work in factories, leaving self-sufficient farming environments and becoming workers, which is what's absolutely driven the economy and why you know, China's economic growth has declined to 6 7 8% last year from 10 to 12%. Uh, and, and as you know, China's expected to, well, will be the biggest uh, economy in the world very soon, if not already. But in, additionally to that, uh, Australia's been successful in signing some free trade agreements with Asian countries. Uh, Japan, Korea, Thailand, Singapore, we've, we've uh, inked a free trade agreement with China, and that's providing new opportunities because the tariffs are reducing. And we've seen in a country like Thailand where tariffs were previously 30%, they're now down for all fresh produce except table grapes down to zero. And that gives us a major advantage over our competitors in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, who in many cases are still paying those 25 or 30% tariffs. And yes, we have a high cost of production. And yes, uh, our exchange rate wasn't favourable two years ago, but these free trade agreements are actually quite significant. However, at the same time, we've got more free trade agreements. Any exporters in the room? Hands up. Grower packer exporters? Okay. You'd be, you, you would know that as these markets have freed up in terms of tariffs uh, and, and non-tariff quotas, uh, non-tariff issues, we've actually had a commensurate increase in the market access issues related to sanitary and phytosanitary. 
So if you're, if you're an exporter 15 or 20 years ago, you would have been shipping product into most markets of, in Asia without any phytosanitary requirements, still doing a good job, but now they've, most, of the, most of our markets are now much more problematic. We still have good access in mature markets who don't produce fruit like uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, but the big gorillas like Indonesia, uh, China, have, after they've joined WTO, have started to implement more quarantine uh, procedures to protect their own industries, and that's had an impact on us. And the one, we've got a number of pests in Australia, but the one outstanding one that causes most grief is, is Queensland fruit fly. Most of our trading partners don't have Queensland fruit fly, so it causes us a lot of problems. So the other thing that's happening in Asia, food safety standards are, or requirements are increasing, which again plays to our, one of our strong suits. Uh, and additionally in, in Asia, local production is declining. So in the past where countries may well have been self-sufficient in food, as urbanisation, as mechanisation, as industrialisations happen, less people producing food, um, they become more, more, more uh, dependent on imports. And using Malaysia as an example, um, you know, Malaysia now is largely a palm oil plantation and where they would have been self-sufficient a lot of food products, their best use of their scarce land resource is to produce uh, oil, palm oil, so they've become an even stronger uh, importer. If we look at Australia's food exports, food exports in general, there's only two countries outside Asia that are in the top 10 markets for Australia. And if we talk about horticulture from Victoria, again, there are only two markets, um, New Zealand and the US, that are in that top 10 in terms of relative importance. So I think that's the story about why Asia is important and why Asian supermarkets are important. Um, if we have a quick look, and Patrick Bazzoni from, uh, from Rabobank identified that you can see in terms of Asia, in terms of uh, um, population growth and, and, and economy growth, you can see where China's right out there, still slowly increasing population. Um, India, quickly increasing population, but, uh, and the size of the dots give you some indication of, of population. You can just see why those why Asian markets are still driving a lot of the consumption. And again, if we use China as an example, uh, China's expenditure on food, you can see across a range of food products, is just growing, not exponentially, but growing at very, very healthy rates. And with a population of 1.2 billion, uh, they're significant consumers. And if we look at fruit, in terms of fruit imports, you can see again, why they've been such a why they've had such a big impact in the international market. So, so the opportunity is, I believe, we are close to the fastest growing region of the world, where consumers are increasingly affluent and urbanised, where quality and safety are our point of difference, where Australia is a trusted, if expensive, supplier, and again, not with all due respect to Australian retailers, um, and we certainly are outproducing in many of our commodities, and without some dramatic increase in exports, uh, we'll see uh, a pretty significant effect. So if we have a quick look, and again, many of you would have been and seen most of these countries, uh, many markets in Asia, there's been a fundamental change in the last 15 years from the wet market approach to uh, fresh sales where everything was sold in a wet market, where people would shop daily, if not twice daily. Uh, and for grocery items, they'd be shopping at small, what were called mom and pop stores, where they'd buy their flour, their rice, their, their, their fast moving consumer goods, to now retailers that are uh, world's best practice. And again, many of you would have been and seen supermarkets in Asia, and at their best, supermarkets in every country in Asia are superior to anything you'll see in Australia. I can say that quite confidently. Uh, there's some, we've got some great supermarkets in Australia, but if you're looking at the best, I'm not suggesting this is one of them, but if you're looking at the best, they really do spend a lot of money to get their supermarkets at best practice. But there's an example, and I'll use some Apple examples during this presentation. There's an example of the display and the variety of apples that are available in one supermarket in Thailand. You can see the shelf, shelf, shelf space that's available. You can see the different varieties and the different packaging. And pre-packs, you know, displayed appropriately, um, very consumer ready and, and attractive. So 
that's why the supermarket uh, the supermarket uh, industry is such an important part of our future development in Australia. But what about what are, what are Asian consumers doing? Well, they're because they've got increasing purchasing power in Asia, unlike Western countries, when Asian people get more money to spend, they spend a disproportionate amount of it on food. Not only a disproportionate amount on food, but a disproportionate amount on fruit, because fruit is considered an everyday item. We're not fighting the rearguard action that we are in Australia to convince the, you know, the, the Gen Xs, the Gen Ys, the, the, the Millenniums, whichever, whichever group we're looking at, who weren't reared with fruit. We're not having to fight a rearguard action to convince them why they should eat fruit. It is fundamentally part of the culture of Asia. So we don't have to jump that bridge. Um, and in general, again, I'm loath to generalise, but in general, imports are considered a superior product. So in many markets, if the product is imported, it's trusted and it's considered a premium product. That's not always the case, and that's one of the challenges we have in Australia. We're considered a first-class supplier of a quality product, but we often don't deliver that, and therefore we disappoint the consumer, and it's an ongoing challenge for the Australian industry. Um, but that urbanisation trend I talked about before is one of the things that means people don't have time, therefore they have to shop more infrequently, and therefore that supermarket environment is quick, convenient and comfortable. So what about modern retail? What, what about this Asian uh, supermarket revolution? There really has been a revolution in the last 20 years. In, in, the early 1900s, there were, in, in the early 1990s, there was not one supermarket in, in China. Now there are tens of thousands, from the big guys where they might have four or 500 stores and 50 hypermarkets right down to the smaller ones. So the supermarket penetration is growing, but still only 20, 25% of consumer uh, purchases are done at retail, modern retail. So you're there, and, but that will continue to grow as it has in every developing country, and that will therefore provide a vehicle for us to be able to promote our product. And food imports are growing, for fresh food imports, particularly fruit, are growing much faster than fast-moving consumer goods. The traditional trade, as I talked about before, is in decline. Um, but it's very difficult to, uh, well, the challenge is for us is how do we penetrate that? And that's where we're going to with this presentation. What do supermarkets want? Supermarkets have many, supermarket buyers are, any, anybody in here actually selling to supermarket buyers in Asia? What about in Australia? Okay. Quite different proposition in Asia. Um, where we've got in Australia, surplus of product, and again, I don't want to denigrate what happens in Australia, but the, the, the supplier, the supplier um, relationship is, is in, in many cases very strong, but the demand in Asia is such that the supplier, whether that be the exporter or the importer of Australian product or the grower packer exporter, has a lot more equity in the market, has a lot more power. Doesn't mean they're going to get twice the value of the product, but they're not, a, they, and they still are to a degree a price taker, but if you're a supermarket buyer in Asia, you need that imported fruit on your shelves. So it's a quite different supplier-customer relationship. Many of the supermarkets, um, and so as I was saying, for, for, the, for the supermarket buyer, it's a tough job. It's the toughest job in retail in Asia, I believe, because when, the, when you're importing product from all over the world, as the exporter, you know the risk you take. Well, as the importer, as the retailer, it's the same risk. It is exactly the same risk, although more so. In China last year, we had a supermarket buyer that was buying chilli and cherries, and they had literally uh, ships lined up across the ocean right back to Chile, and they had 80 containers of fruit coming in for particular promotions. And when the Chinese government decided for a range of reasons that they didn't want to there was a phytosanitary issue. All those shipments, one after the other, had to find another home. And you can imagine what that does to Hong Kong, Singapore, Indonesia, if it's going to go to other markets. So certainly there is risk. Um, and therefore, the supermarket buyers, in general, in some countries, don't last very long. And that's a challenge for us, where you build a relationship with a supermarket buyer and they move on to an easier job in the same supermarket or they become part of management. On the other hand, I genuinely believe that there is a passion for fresh in Asia, and the buyers that I've worked with over the years, if they get it and they like it, they, they become 
very good buyers and they understand the supply situation much better. So what are they, what are they looking for? What are supermarket buyers, what are their challenges? Purchasing's a major challenge. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, most purchases in a supermarket were done by an importer. So the importer took the risk and would supply on a daily basis, which was great. But you know, um, consistent with the stories we heard earlier, where consumers and supermarkets want to know more about where the fruit comes from, they want a better connection with the, with the supply chain, there's a lot more direct business happening now. And you know, if you're a cynic, you'd say it's because they want to take people out of the value chain and, and reduce the cost. And there is an element of that, of course, because they want to get the product in front of their consumers at as cheap as price as possible and therefore drive demand. But it's much more about understanding what's actually happening in the supply end and, and how it all works. So purchasing is a major challenge. Attracting and maintaining customers um, is, is a major one. Again, when, when supermarkets were early in, in, into Asian markets, there was a shortage of capacity. Now that's not necessarily the case. It's still the case in some countries, but in other countries there's the same penetration of retail as there is in Australia. And therefore it's a constant challenge for a buyer to continue to get people in the door. Reducing shrink. Uh, in general, um, the fresh produce department in most Asian supermarkets is one of the highest profit parts of the business. Uh, but, and CEOs love that but they just don't understand that the shrink that goes with a fresh product, particularly fresh fruit and vegetables, is going to be higher and there's constant uh, pressure on the, on the, the uh, buyer to reduce shrink. And that's, there's a real opportunity for Australia there to work with, with some of our customers to help them do that because I think we've got that pretty well under control in Australia. Um, comp maintaining margins, as I said before, competition, um, it's very common for a, car for buyer to step over three or four times a day to the Tesco store over, over the road to see what the price is and there's a constant challenge on price and they'll drop a baht or a dollar or a peso based on trying to drive price competitiveness which is not in our long term interest of course but competition's a, a constant battle and I believe fundamentally which leads into the rest of the presentation is that Asian buyers are genuinely looking for partners not suppliers. They want people that are invested in their business. So, um, you know, what are the key issues they're looking for? And a bit like Kerry said before, it's all about the C's. Um, I think it's about commitment, it's about connection, it's about a consumer focus, it's about consistency and quality in terms of building sales, it's about innovation, cutting edge innovation, creativity, and cash to promote sales. It's not all about above the line promotions. Often people think that this is how you buy business or how you buy goodwill. It's one of the lowest of lowest importance, but nonetheless still one of the key issues. So commitment to me means just a long-term investment in the business development. It's not about putting product onto the ocean and saying, bye-bye, I hope it works for you. It's about what's a program we might be able to invest in, how can I, in my business as a supplier, whether I'm an exporter or a packer or a grower, what can I do down here to help your business grow up there? Not easy. And in the, in the examples that, uh, that Cathy gave before were fantastic examples of where individual companies are doing that in the US. And there are some examples in Australia, but we've got a different situation, much smaller population, a more fragmented industry. We don't get hundreds of millions of dollars every four years from the government, from the farm bill to, to grow promotion, to be able to provide promotion, promotions in Asia. So we have got a slightly different situation. But that, that commitment is the thing that sustains business in good, good times and bad, and it's what maintains ongoing business. The price is always an issue that needs to be negotiated, but the commitment to being involved in the business is a fundamental one. And, you know, as both the previous speakers said, many consumers now want to know who the growers are, who the suppliers are, and, and the retailer is really our window to the consumer. So consumer focus, um, look, the buyer is our customer. When we talk to the buyer, many of us think that the buyer is our customer. This is the price, thank you, good, over to you. Um, Walmart have a saying that says, uh, we are the window pane between the customer, from the supplier to the customer. We are not the person that's promoting your product. We're just providing a vehicle and an opportunity for you to do your job in Asia. Now, again, the, the brands we saw before from the US may well be able to do that. It's not easy for many of our companies, but we've just, 
This culture change is quite important in terms of if the consumer gets a bad experience, it reflects on everybody. And we've seen many, many examples where we, uh, unfortunately, where, or a number of examples where if we disappoint the consumer today, those sales don't respond for five or six or seven weeks. And Gavin Wiley's here from Montague's and lots of experience in promotions and summer fruit being the classic example of if, that, if, if consumers have a good experience early in the season, they'll continue through the season. If they have a poor experience at the start of the season, roughly four or six weeks before they'll even attempt to come back into that business. So the consumer is fundamentally important. And the other thing about um, the consumer focus is, is many of these companies do have excellent CRM systems, you know, uh, client customer relationship management systems. But in fast moving consumer goods, it, that, that data is used every day. If you're a Mars or, or a Coca-Cola, you will have people in, in stores every day looking at the sales and adjusting and, and looking at what's happening in this store. And it'll influence your branding, it'll influence who your consumer is, it'll influence what you should be doing in terms of future product development. These systems are there for fruit and vegetables, but I'm not aware of anybody in the world, and I, I, I say this, who actually uses that to the degree to which it can actually deliver results. And I'll give you a very quick example at the moment, uh, in, in a moment about how that can actually work. So the consumer focus is fundamental, and it's not about the retailer focusing on the consumer. It's about us, to the extent that we can, focusing on the consumer. Uh, consistency and quality, that's the thing that every consumer wants. It's what we talked about before. If you're really going to grow a brand or grow a category, consistent quality, uh, which leads to consistent price, which leads to re resales, which means people understand the brand and they're happy to go back. If, if you're going to promote a product, the, the worst thing you can possibly do is promote a product that's not going to delight the consumer. You're better to say nothing. You're better to just move the product into the market, let the people who want to buy it, buy it. But if you, if you put your hand up and say, hey, this is from Victoria, it's a great product, <coughs> and the supplier doesn't meet the expectations of the consumer, that's 10 times worse than doing nothing. Um, cutting edge, innovation is a fundamental one. We, we can't always do it. There's some fantastic examples. Again, we saw some before. This, this can be any number of ways. <coughs> Excuse me. Every buyer, um, every Asian buyer is always looking for the angle that will help them push your product or their product against their competitors. So whether that's packaging, again, the carrot example was a ripper about the junk food, but there, it doesn't have to be quite as extensive as that. It may well be just the way you package, it's the way you promote the product, it's the way you pitch the product. Um, but innovation ca can be as simple as the, the kiwi fruit industry in New Zealand have a very extensive marketing campaign in Asia. And one of the things that worked very well for them was actually doing work in schools uh, to introduce kiwi fruit to kids. And they used an innovative approach to do it. This is in Thailand. And they found, and they, they've got footage of uh, school kids dragging their mother into the supermarket, seeing the kiwi fruit on the shelf, and actually saying, I want some of that, because that actually influenced the person that was making, who was desiring the product. And it may or may not have been the mother or father, it was the child. So uh, innovation is, is fundamentally important. At, and let's not dismiss, though, um, that cash can be important. It's about promoting sales. Uh, and again, you need to be careful about how you do this. Uh, if you've got a, if you're talking about promotions in terms of discounts, that's a completely different story to promotions which are about selling the value of the product. It's very problematic promoting product on discount unless there's a, a very good story behind it. If you're selling tuna or you're selling Heinz baked beans and you discount, the consumer never doubts that the product will be the same in that can or in that processed food irrespective of the price. So it's a genuine reduction, it's a genuine discount. If on the other hand you've got a fresh product, in the back of the mind of the consumer, is this an inferior product? Are they trying to move this off the shelf quickly because it's coming to the end of its shelf life? It's not to say that they don't work, but you have to be much more careful about using price as a, as a promotion tool. So using a, using a practical example, um, I'll just give you a quick example about top supermarket in Thailand. I was based in Thailand for some time for the Department of Primary Industry and developed a relationship with nearly all the supermarket buyers and each of them had a different, different approach to purchasing. A couple of quick examples. Tops built their business. They are the premium retailer in Thailand and they built their business on being the premium retailer. 
Tesco built their business on being the cheapest in the market. Both valid approaches to, to driving business. But Tesco learned after four or five years is only so far you can go with price. And if it's a locally produced product and you can screw the grower down and continue to drive the price back to the grower, it, it may be sustainable for a certain amount of time. But they soon learned that their affluent purchases became tired of the price and the quality that went consistent with that price. So they started to move across to the premium retailers, often paying two and three times the price that they were paying for a locally produced product. But nonetheless, their model changed. So they also have moved up that value chain to try and attract a different uh, clientele. So Tops is the premium retailer. They go over 500 stores in Thailand. Uh, they started direct purchasing about 10 years ago and, and now probably 80% of their, of their product are imported. They target A and B consumers and, and, and they've got uh, I've never seen a better uh, customer relationship tool and many people are more experienced than me haven't either and they use it every day. Um, and in that store, in that business, fruit is the number one driver of profit. It's the biggest profit centre in the whole of that, of that supermarket business. So but they're both rewarded for that but they also get a lot of scrutiny for it. And, um, you know, they're a very experienced retailer. They have... Uh, people in each store who look after the quality of the product, look after the merchandising and make sure that the consumer in many cases is, uh, in most cases, is well serviced. And using as an example, uh, you know, imports are so important. They're talking about apples again using the apple category. An apple a day keeps the doctor away, but we commit to uh, range a minimum of eight varieties of apples from eight different countries every day of the year. So it gives you some idea about where, which customers they're pitching for and the importance to them of imports. And, you know, just a range of different uh, products. So the Pink Lady program that uh, our department was involved with with, uh, with Montagues, and Gavin can talk about this later if need be, looked at all those characteristics of, of commitment, connection, consumer focus, uh, consistency and quality, some innovation and some promotional budgets. So, the buyer visited Australia. We introduced them to a range of suppliers. The background to the Pink Lady story is the apple industry in Australia exports less than 1% of production where it used to drive exports 40 years ago. The industry realises this is, this is quite a dangerous situation given production is growing, given we, we're, on the, uh, we're at risk of some serious imports from New Zealand and potentially from North America. So there's a drive for the industry to increase exports. Um, and this was an opportunity for us to do some marketing of the Pink Lady brand in Asia. The irony is the Pink Lady brand is the be probably one of the best known brands in the, in the world, grown all over the world. Australia owns the brand and APEL gets benefit from the levies, but we get next to no uh, export business happening overseas, partly because of our cost, but partly because the domestic market's been a good market for our growers and there hasn't been a big impact on impetus to actually export. So a range of activities were, were conducted. So the buyer came and visited grower packer exporters, uh, decided to partner with Montagues, agreed on a retail program, uh, we agreed on a promotional program, uh, we organised a launch event uh, with Thai officials and Australian government officials. The Australian, grower, Australian growers visited Thailand to witness the program and not just the supplier but others to just see if this is a model that might work for them in different markets. There's a range of promotional activities conducted for store prizes for the most effective uh, promotion in an individual store to try and, to and incentivise the store managers. Uh, premiums for the buyers, so they got a gift. And again, this is a, a, another way of actually driving sales without giving a discount. We know if you give a price discount, it will drive sales while the discount's on, but when the discount drops off, unless there's a real value proposition, it drops off. And then uh, an SMS program, so because they've got such a great customer relationship manager tool, they know who buys apples every day and they know what they buy. So there was an SMS campaign out to the 8,000 up to 25,000 major buyers, which was basically saying pink ladies are in store, here's an opportunity to try an Australian apple, again, which was very successful. Active sellers, promoters and publicity. Evaluated the program. The buyers visited Australia again to confirm future programs and that program's now in its fourth year. That program, I think, demonstrated quite a lot of those commitment, uh, connection, customer focus sort of attributes. 
Um, and using just a few shots, this is Sapaldi Namanakite, who is the buyer for tops, a diminutive young woman, but uh, an absolute tiger of a buyer, and uh, has driven that business uh, to being, as I say, the number one profit centre. So this was, and, and the major licensee for Pink Ladies, Peter Richardson, was one of the, the companies that, that she met. Then we ran a launch event with the CEO of, of Top Supermarket with an Australian Pink Lady branding program. At the time, we took over other members and the companies that, that we talked about before, Batlow were there, the major apple producing companies in Australia all visited to see the success or otherwise of this. And we had Australian embassy staff and Austrade staff and the major managers of the, of the company there. Branding, promotional materials, and then the buyer providing advice to the industry about what their requirements are. Talking about similar sorts of things. What are the things that you can help me with to drive my business? If you can do this, I think we can do that. If, if you're prepared to make that commitment, this is what can happen. And this particular buyer is very, very open and very transparent. And trust me, their fresh produce is the dearest in the market, by far, sometimes twice the price of, of competitors. And yet their value to their consumers is such that they are able to command those margins. And these are the Australian companies that wanted to learn how that worked. Um, and, you know, fresh uh, active sellers, uh, publicity company involved with the promotion. Claire Fitchett, hand up, Claire. <laughs> Claire Fitchett with some of the innovation, including cars and, and buses with signage on it uh, and in, in store. The growers, the, sorry, the growers uh, at a networking function talking about their business and how they'd like to drive their business. And then a follow up visit after the first year's program with a range of Asian companies who are also interested after, after the success of this one to actually engage in a program. So that's the journey that, was ta that took place with Pink Lady Apples. I hope, it, I think it demonstrated some of those, some of those uh, elements that I believe are what Asian supermarkets want. I genuinely believe they want that commitment. They want to see back to where the product is, is grown and they want a long-term commitment, not just a, a short-term supply arrangement. They want connection with the grower. They want, and people talk about relationships in Asia. It's a cliche, but fundamentally that's what drives business and what sustains business. The consumer focus, it's our responsibility to understand what the consumer wants. Um, consistency and quality is a fundamental requirement if you want to build sales. We do need innovation if we're going to se separate ourselves from some of our competitors, and we will have to, we will have to fund. If the presumption is that export markets have better returns than domestic markets, that's not the right parameter, not the right premise. The premise is if we want to diversify from what's an already oversupplied domestic market and have some diversification for our industries, we need to build these deep relationships in Asia. And that will sometimes mean you get better returns, sometimes mean you'll get less returns, but it will be a way for us to maintain the, our domestic market, but also build sales in the fastest growing area of the world.